Now we're going to actually talk about two types of innovation today. In the first part of my talk, which is focused exclusively on how hosts evolve in the face of viral challenges, we're going to uh, specify innovation in protein coding genes. And so if you consider what a protein coding gene arbitrarily looks like, um, it's, it's this sort of sequence that I've indicated here, where we've got three triplets, three codons, that specify three amino acids that will be incorporated into the protein that is produced from this gene. Now you can see on this side, you have a mutation that does not alter the amino acid being encoded. We refer to these as silent or synonymous changes because from a very sort of rough approximation, natural selection is really acting on the protein coding sequences. And here, because the protein coding sequence has not altered, we refer to these as silent or synonymous changes. In contrast, you can see here, we have again a single amino acid mutation which is uh, altered one of the amino acids that's being encoded, so-called non-synonymous or replacement changes. Now, both of these are sort of equal likelihood mutations. You can actually have a synonymous mutation or a non-synonymous mutation. But you can appreciate that based on the genetic code, you're much more likely to see an amino acid altering mutation just if by random chance alone. So consider the uh, sort of situation where you actually had a gene, we refer to these as pseudogenes, that at some point in their evolutionary history encoded for a particular protein. Now, if you consider this gene now in its current degenerate form, let's say from the chimpanzee genome versus the human genome, and we were to just roughly calculate the number of synonymous changes versus replacement changes, we have to correct for the fact that there are many more possible replacement changes. So when you normalize for that correction, you will find that because this gene no longer codes for a protein, the rate of synonymous changes and the rate of replacement changes are roughly equal. And that's because selection has stopped worrying about this part of the genome in terms of its protein coding capacity. It has tolerated both mutations and they roughly go to fixation in a fairly random fashion. Now for most genes in the genome, you do care about the final product being produced, which is the amino acid sequence of the resulting protein. So here I have this hypothetical example where you have a protein coding gene that is basically represented in these triplets of codons, and what you'll see is there's a lot more blue changes or non-amino acid altering or silent changes. And very rarely do you see something which looks like a replacement or a, repla uh, a replacement or a non-synonymous change. The net result is that regardless of all of this change at the nucleotide level, the amino acid sequence remains Steve, because Steve is really what is being selected for by evolution. Very rarely do you see a deviation from this optimal amino acid sequence. For instance, we can see sieve coming in in terms of this sort of grammar. The net result is not that we should infer that mutation has now stopped hitting the replacement sites. What we infer from this is because mutation has introduced changes in both replacement and synonymous positions, the fact that we don't see replacement changes over the course of evolution is an indication that natural selection acted upon these changes, deemed them deleterious, and removed them from the population before they had a chance to really spread uh, in the population, which means mutation is not really causing this bias between the blue and the red changes. It's actually natural selection, and more specifically, purifying selection that is acting to purify the population from these presumed deleterious mutations. The net result is if you were to now compare the rate of synonymous and replacement changes, we will find that the rate of replacement changes is actually much lower than synonymous changes, regardless of the fact that both of these changes were introduced in roughly the same proportion. My lab is actually interested in the other class of genes that emerges from these kinds of analysis. Here again, now we have a triplet code of sequences that encodes for my name in amino acid code. And what we will see when we compare across this sequence is that there are a lot more red changes than blue changes. In fact, a lot more red changes than what you'd expect, even by chance alone. It's in fact easier to align these sequences at the nucleotide level than it is to align them at the amino acid level, where my name can change to a popular car model very quickly because every mutation has a high likelihood of altering the amino acid being encoded. And this is exactly the signature we see when you have an interface that is precisely at the interface between a host and a virus conflict. And that's because every single one of these amino acid mutations is potentially beneficial and has, acted, uh, has been acted upon by natural selection 
to increase their rate of fixation in the population. Hence the term diversifying selection. In contrast to purifying selection, natural selection is increasing the amino acid diversity of these protein coding genes. As a result, what we have again is an apparent rate of replacement changes, Ka or Dn, which is increased over the apparent rate of synonymous changes. Once again, this is not a bias that is introduced by mutation. This is simply a different selective sieve that is acted upon by natural selection. This term, diversifying selection, is also referred to as positive selection or adaptive evolution. I'll use these terms interchangeably, and they're only different in the context of the tempo of which these changes happen. Now, if you were to take these characteristics of uh, replacement rates and synonymous rates and calculate them for all genes that we can compare between three sets of species, our own species genome, the rhesus macaque, or the chimpanzee genome, what we have is this very nice histogram which really reflects the selective constraints that have acted on all the protein coding genes within our genome. What you'll see is there's a large number of genes in the left-hand side of this histogram, which means for the bulk of the genes in the human genome, purifying selection or a dearth of replacement changes is really what is going on. We are very interested in this sort of small blip of genes right here, where you actually have a very small set of genes, which even at the whole gene level, have undergone much faster replacement changes, almost breaking the speed limit of evolution, if you will, to increase because of this diversity. And when you take a really close look at this category of genes, immunity genes are really overrepresented, as you might expect, because these genes have been acted upon repeatedly by natural selection.